Okay, cool. So first of all, welcome to everyone. Just maybe to introduce myself. Um, my name is Eitan Stern. I'm a, uh, oh, let's move this thing out the way. I don't know if you can see that. Let's move that out the way. Um, I'm a commercial and an entertainment lawyer. Um, I have been around the tech and creative industry for many years. Um, and a lot of my work is all about blending my love for creativity and for art and for uh, the tech industry and blending that with my interest in business and uh, law and kind of merging these two worlds. And that's very much what we do here at Legalese. Maybe just a bit of a brief about Legalese. This is some of the people, some photos of people from the team. So Legalese, for those who haven't worked with us or don't know, we are what we call a creative legal agency, but it's largely a term that, that uh, we made up. Bottom line is uh, we specialize in all types of legal services around the creative um, and tech industry, music, media. We are a new breed of lawyers who try to operate in uh, more accessible and more affordable ways. And we often end up working on all sides of the creative and tech industry. So working for companies, for developers, for gaming companies, for musicians, for artists. We work for galleries and artists. So we very much blend a lot of the sides of the um of the industry um, and yeah we're, i'm part of a team of lawyers who are very passionate about this so we mix our love for law with our interest and our love for tech and business so that's just a little bit about us to give you a little bit of context um so what are we doing here today it's a great question um so today we are here to talk about intellectual property Okay, we're going to talk about all sides of intellectual property. I want to look into what is it? So it'll be a little bit of a nerdy uh, academic look to actually what is intellectual property, but I think it's important to know, because if once we start to delve into the core of it, we can really understand the implications and the uses of it, um, and as well as how to protect it. So we're going to look at what it is, how we get it, um, how we understand it, and how we protect it. All right. Before we start, um, I'm getting quite good or good, quite familiar with these online webinars by now. So I've kind of mastered the dual screens um, and be able to manage questions through Zoom um, and the, through the chat and the Q&A feature while I do the talk. I mean, I'm saying I've mastered it now, but as I've said it, I'll probably make a mistake with or to drop the screen or something uh, just because I've said it. That being said, um, please feel free to interrupt me. I will ask all the questions you need to ask um, and get all the answers you need. So, you know, what we, what we, what the, I can talk about IP all day, you know, and, and how to protect it and the different aspects. But the reality is what we're trying to do is we try, I want people here to get the information that, that they need from it. Um, I want you to kind of get out of this talk what you need to get out of it. So, you know, please ask the questions. If you want me, if you stop at something and want to know something about it, ask it. If I can't get to it, then I'll leave the questions to the end. But, you know, the idea is to make this as useful as possible for the people here. All right. Everyone can see my slideshow, right? I'm assuming the answer is yes. Okay. Let me see if maybe someone from the office messaged me to say all's working. Great. Okay, cool. So, perfect. Thank you, Tasha. Okay, cool. So, that's uh, the general context of it. Now, it's time to dig in. So, we are living in a world in which ideas really are the most valuable assets for companies, right? And what do I mean by this? Well, if we look at five of the biggest companies around today, they're all doing things which, which never even existed 10 years ago. This is quite kind of trite by now, but you know, if we think about something like Uber, they invented ride hailing, which is now a massive industry. Airbnb created this idea of house hotels. It didn't exist before Airbnb started doing it. Instagram recreated photo diaries. Uh, this is actually the first innovation in photo, in photo albums since you know our grandmothers and grandparents were, were 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 compiling photo albums of our parents as babies, so you know, and actually, it's interesting when Instagram was acquired for a billion dollars, obviously a lot worth a lot more today. It only had thirteen employees. You know, if we think about a company like Snapscan, completely reinvented payment systems in South Africa, where it's had a massive uptake and really rethought of the way that we deal with payments. I guess the point of what I'm trying to get here is that. 
ideas of IP and software companies, right, have completely exploded and taken over the world. And this is something that, you know, has been happening for the last decade or so. It's something which is just going to continue um, happening as, as technology starts to uh, grow within the world and, and the use of technology builds for all of us. And when we look at, say, I actually been preparing this talk, I had a look at the 10 biggest companies in the world at the moment. Um, three of them, you know, Amazon, Apple, and Alphabet, which is a parent company for Google, they are three of the top 10 companies in the world or all IP focused companies. And this year there's been a huge shift. The rest, most of the other seven companies uh, in the top 10 are all pharmaceutical companies, right? Which is interesting. interesting. It wasn't like that last year. Obviously the answer is quite obvious. It's because of the COVID vaccine. A lot of companies started delving uh, and putting a lot of money into developing very, very valuable IP of these vaccinations. And it's completely reshifted the business landscape of, or, you know, the economic landscape of some of the biggest companies in the world. And I suppose what I'm trying to get at there is, is, you know, this COVID vaccine, like all other, a uh, lot of the assets that the biggest companies in the world are selling are intellectual property, whether that's good or bad, that, you know, the COVID vaccine can be owned as intellectual property. That's the state of it. Companies invested heavily into this IP uh, it could be reproduced by other people, but it's not going to be because it is owned by someone. And I just think that whether we agree with that or not, I do think that is quite a fascinating thing. But the biggest issue with this idea that IP has kind of taken over the world and taken over the business world is that the biggest asset in, in all of this is also the biggest weakness. Because IP, or intellectual property, I'm going to keep saying IP, everyone should know that that's an acronym for intellectual property, by its nature, it is ethereal, it's, it's not, it's often not something tangible that we can, you know, hold in our hands, it's code, it's shareable by its nature, it's design, um, it's quite easy to copy and steal, well, much more easy to copy and steal than hardware. So if you looked at the old generation of the biggest companies in the world, they were almost always uh, automotive companies. So Ford, um, Volkswagen, these were massive companies where it was, they had massive gains because hardware, cars, big machines were the big things that, that created big companies, but today it's software. And I think this, this example of TSMC is a fascinating one for me. It's something I've been reading about in this, uh, a lot late, lately. TSMC is a company which the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, you may or may not have heard of them, but you almost certainly are, have products that cre are created by them or are using it right now. I certainly am. I mean, I'm on a Mac computer in front of me, the chips in, well, not the Mac computer necessarily, but I've got an iPhone. The chip in the iPhone is, is made by TSMC. Um, most computer chips are going to be made by TSMC. And TSMC has such a, a giant um, hold over the market because they build uh, chips, semiconductor chips that go into technology that, you know, it said that if the US or, or any other country invested an, an unlimited amount of money, trillions of dollars into, to, into trying to compete with TSMC, they couldn't do it. Why? Because as the old saying goes, building hardware is hard, you know, and, and the gains that you have from building hardware can really, really solidify you um, as a massive company, with, with, which is hard to kind of, you know, uh, take over. But that's not always going to be the case with IP, right? When, you, when your main asset is hardware, that's quite solid. But when your main asset is intellectual property, it's also your greatest risk and because it can be stolen and copied so easily. So if you take a company like Uber, Uber, well, they didn't quite invent ride hailing, but pretty much invented it. Um, not long after they started operating, there's many other companies entered that space. And you've got DD and uh, Taxify and, and Lyft and the rest of them. And that's a big risk for them. They, they, they are losing market share because the idea can be, can be recreated so easily. So I guess the point that I'm trying to get you is with IP, your biggest asset is actually your biggest risk. And like everything with a company, risk needs to be managed. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here today. So that's a bit of an intro on why we're talking about this and why it's important. But what I want to quickly, what I want to do is take a step backwards. I want to look a bit about the history of this and what we're actually talking about. So firstly, what is property? I think if we better understand what property is, we can better understand intellectual property. 
And property, property is anything. It's, it, it, well, it's actually defined as a thing that belongs to, to someone. And you'll see in that definition is really interesting in minutes. And that's, you know, my iPhone, a car, a house. You know, it's something that belongs to something. And essentially, we have then had laws that govern how we utilize property. Right? And these laws are very old bodies of law, laws that have been recreated and re redefined over many, many uh, centuries. And essentially, property law does two things. It aims firstly to govern the relationship that we have with our property, right, that a person and object has. So to give you an example, I can own a car and I can drive the car, it's mine, but I can't drive the car into the middle of Cape Town Stadium. So I am restricted to some extent of what I can do with my property because of the laws. Another thing that it does is it governs the relationship that we have with each other in relation to property, right? Person in person. So, you know, you sitting there, you're watching this on your computer, that's your computer. I can't steal your computer, not because your computer has human rights or inherent rights. I can't steal the, your computer because you own it. So your computer is the center point of a relationship that we have with each other. And you're going to find that every legal system around it deals with property differently, but it's, you know, it's, it's often this interaction of how we deal with property that's really, really crucial in defining how society works. And often people think of property law as quite something quite flippant, it's really easy and natural, but it's really not. It's one of the center, the, the views of how your society deals with property is one of the center points of your society. Take, for example, uh, capitalism uh, against communism, right? The Cold War that was uh, almost fought many decades ago. You know, the world came to the brink of nuclear war, kind of based on a different view of how different societies believed we should relate to property and relate to each other. Capital communism obviously thinking the state should be a center point in ownership, whereas capitalism thinking that we should be able to grow our wealth and our property as much as possible. If you look at American law, Abraham Lincoln made one change to property law, led to civil war, uh, it led to a civil war and led to one of the single biggest moments in, in modern history, right? He decided people could not be property. And it led to the civil war and it led to the end of slavery, which undoubtedly is one of the most significant events of, uh, of, uh, of the last century or two, uh, or the last couple of centuries. And so, you know, really if the point that I'm trying to get to is that Property is not insignificant. It, the way that our society views property is crucial. Right, I hope everyone's with me. So from discussing that, I wanna discuss one particular type of property. That's intellectual property, right? What is intellectual property? Well, it's exactly what the words say. It is property of the mind. So just like a cell phone, can be physical property, and we have laws to protect how we relate to our physical property. We also have laws that govern how we relate to our intellectual property. And in general, we have these laws for two main reasons, right? IP law is there to, to, to govern two main things. We, we need to be able to protect intellectual property so that people can get recognition for creating it, and people can get financial benefit from creating it right? And that's kind of it. And everything that we talk about today around IP is really going to be to come back to making sure people can get recognition for creating things and financial benefit from creating them. Maybe a small bit of history on this, which I think is fascinating. This idea of intellectual property um, goes back to Elizabethan times, uh, the, you know, the medieval times, essentially, and where people, where the king would give certain people exclusive rights to certain services, right? So they'd say, listen, you can be the, the, the blacksmith in the town and you're going to be the butcher of the town. And only those people are essentially able to own those trades, own the IP in those trades. Um, what happened with that system and the feudal system is, you know, essentially the king would allow his friends and cronies to uh, to 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 have those certain industries, um, and so it advance advantage some people over the other. And I think that's interesting because as as for as long as we've had power in society, we've had some aspects of corruption, which I think is just fascinating. But essentially, we are going to always see this blend between two between things when we talk about IP. We talk, we're always going to see this, this balance between trying to protect IP and trying to create free trade. 
And everything that we do with IP law is a mixture between two, these two things. And once we really understand that, I think it's really, we're really going to open up our minds around IP in our society. And why do I say this? So if you think about a creative agency, right, an advertising agency, what do they do for a living? Well, they create ideas, they create campaigns. And the nature of it is they want as many eyes as possible on their work, but they also want to control their work so that other people can't use it without their permission. So they want to create ideas that anyone can use, but they want to control them so no one can use without permission. That's that balance, protecting your ideas and your IP against wanting people to use it. If we think about music, you see the same thing. You create a song, you want the whole world to hear it. And that's how you get financial benefit uh, from it but, and recognition. But you also want to control. Well, the whole world hearing it is how you get recognition. But if you control it and make sure people can only listen to it if they pay you, that's where you get the financial benefit. So you're always going to see this balance, right? And that's really a built-in problem with IP. You want it both to be shared and seen as much as possible, but you want to protect it. So it's really important. There's a really important question when you are creating IP and deciding what to do with it in your particular business. You need to start with the question of what do I want to do with this IP, right? And just like you might have a creative process in figuring out how to create IP, law is actually a creative process as well. And you need a method in deciding, well, how do I want to protect and utilize this IP? If you're at home and you're finding this a bit confusing, it's because it is a little bit confusing, but we, and we are gonna to get to something a little bit more practical now, but I think it's really interesting thing for us to understand the kind of background here before we dig deeper. All right. So what I wanna do from here is I just wanna clear up a few kind of miscon well, misconceptions, definitions around IP, which are relevant to you. Um, and we don't need to go in depth in here, but I think it's really important that we sort of understand, if we understand what IP is, let's start to understand the different types and the, the, and the related protection that we have for those, those types of IP. Okay, so the first one, and, and thus we see people mistaking these definitions all the time. So I do think it's important to, to get to the bottom of them. So the first one is a patent. Okay, what is a patent? A patent is the protection, the legal protection that a person or a company can get for ownership over a new invention. This is not for ideas. This is not for designs. This is when you create something that didn't exist before, right? And the guidelines of what can be patented and what can't be quite technical, but as a general idea, you're trying to find something novel, new, um, that, that didn't exist and something that hasn't been released into the world. So back to the COVID vaccine, these are patented ideas, did not technology that did not exist in the past. It's not, and someone is able to create something new for the world and that you get patents for. So it's generally quite technical things, chemicals, in, inventions, machinery, uh, uh, gadgets, the, the sort, uh, gadgets, this is the sort of thing which you get patents over. Right. For most people's businesses, this is not the type of IP that you're trying, the IP protection that you're going for. The next one is trademarks. Now, this is probably going to be relevant for most businesses. A trademark is the legal protection that you get over a string of words or a logo or a company name. OK, so if your company has a name, which I'm sure it does, and you've got a logo, which it probably does, you can patent that. So, sorry, you can trademark that so no one else can copy it or use it. Right, the name legalese, registered trademark, the logo, registered trademark, belongs to us, so it's got some value in it. The next one is design registrations, and this is really relevant for creative the creatives out there and designers, maybe furniture manufacturers, maybe people making plumbing products, where you can uh, register the ownership of a specific design that's either um, a technical or an aesthetic design. If you say, listen, I've designed a chair, and this is very significant in the way that it's designed, um, and therefore, I want to own that chair. That would be a that you could get a design registration over that, and then no one else could do the same design for, over the, uh, of that chair. The last one is going to be copyrights, and this copyright you find everywhere. And copyright is the legal protection that you have over things like music, film, writing, art. Um, you know, the, 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 the creations, artistic creations that we have over us. So if you write a book or, or, or write a song, um, the, you, you can own the copyright over that. And in South Africa, copyright is automatic. So just from creating it, you own the copyright in it. Um, it, it, does, it does become a process of proving you were the first one to create it. 
So, you know, you, it, so you, you need to think about how you're going to prove that. But copyright is the protection that you have over that. And you don't need to do anything to own the copyright. You just have it because you created it. I hope that it's starting to make some sense. Uh, no questions this yet. I'm taking that as a good thing. Um, but remember, feel free to shoot questions or ask them there. So those are the four types of, of intellectual property that I want to talk about. Um, but what I want to look at next is, next is usage. So that's property, and that's intellectual property. But it, it's one thing to have it. It's quite another thing to know how to use it. So I want to look at three general ways in which companies are able to put their intellectual property to, to work. This is something that if you're running a business, you can be thinking about in terms of your IP strategy. What I keep saying is you need a strategy around your IP, right? If you create cars, your strategy is easy. You're going to sell the car. But when it's IP, it might be a little bit more involved or in-depth or complex or new. So let's look at it. So the first type of, uh, of, of uh, use of IP is what I would call like running it as a going concern. We've seen a massive rise of SaaS companies over the last decade, right? This is software as a service or other types of software companies where you're creating IP and you're running it and you're letting it run. This is a really fantastic business model as we've come to realize because first of all, software is scalable right? You often have very marginal costs for scaling it. So your cost for one customer or hundred customers would be roughly the same, obviously more server costs and that sort of thing, but it's, it's a very scalable model. Can be quite low on staff. You know, as I said earlier, Instagram, when they sold for a billion dollars, they had 13 staff. Um, often software and, and your know, digital businesses have recurring income. It's, 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 it's a model that lends itself quite nicely. Recurring income is obviously a fantastic thing for any business to have. Um, and lastly, there's often no product or no physical product. You know, and as, uh, you know, with, with all businesses, if you've got no physical products, you've got no insurance over products, you have no complex production line, it can be a really, really lean business if you're able to somehow create IP and run that IP as part of your business. Um, and, you know, if you're putting that IP to work. So I call that running it as a business, as a going concern. The next one is going to be licenses, right? So remember I said a minute ago, IP is just like any other property. It can be bought and sold at a price, right? And intellectual property is no different to that, right? So you can create a concept of some code, and then you can essentially rent it to other people for a specific purpose. Although with IP, we don't call it rentals. We call it a license, what is a license? That's, that's the definition which I like. And it's an express permission to allow one person to use the IP of another. And if you actually look at it, we start to see these IP model, the, these license models everywhere in our society and some places that you, you know, that you might actually find quite surprising. So, you know, one easy example would be Getty Images. That's a stock photo uh, website. Mm where you know that what they do is they offer a platform for you to be able to load your photos and for other people to license your photos from them right that's a fantastic use case of of creating ip of photos being able to license them through an online platform another one would be the ipod now I do, you know i think that someone at home is probably saying hey Tan, you, you you're smoking your socks the ipod is an apple product um might surprise you to know it's not really an apple product right? The iPod is, is an amalgamation, definitely by Apple, uh, but it's an amalgamation of a, of a number of other products. It took about a year from Apple to conceptualize an iPod to launching it, which is incredibly fast. And the way that they did that is by compiling other, other, other products together. The core of it being a hard drive that Toshiba had designed, right? They had designed a very small hard drive that could um, hold a bunch of data on it, and Apple looked at it and said, great, we've got a use case for that. They licensed it from Toshiba, right? That exclusive license for that from Toshiba. And off they went a year later, we had the iPod. We really see these everywhere. Um, uh, there's a car that I see on the roads often. Um, the, oh, I forget the name. The Duster, the Renault, I believe it's a Renault Duster. That car is, not, is actually produced by another company and it's just the the Renault uh, logo that's put on it. So we really start to see these things everywhere, these licenses everywhere. And why is this relevant for you? Because I think in your company, in your business, you can start to really look at what IP you're creating. 
And how could you license that to other people? That might be your methodologies if you're creating, um, if you are, are creating educational resources, your method, your educational methodologies. That could be your, if you're a creative agency, you could create campaigns, license them to brands. So instead of you creating a campaign for a brand that that brand then owns, you can create a campaign for yourself and then you could license that to your clients. And it's a small shift in the business model, but it really is quite a powerful shift to start thinking about. I mean, franchises are no different. You know, every spa that you see around, why, why people would see more value in, in having a spa than an independent uh, cafe because people hold certain ideas and thoughts around the name spa also if you so, so people might would buy into that franchise because people are going to be able uh, are more willing to shop at that franchise and that is a spa creating ip around their name around their business processes and licensing it through a franchise to other people to use licensing is crucial because you know, because we see these everywhere around us. And I think that, and one of the things to know about these licenses is that what becomes crucial is to start to figure out the license terms that you have into a license agreement. So if you are going to start licensing IP, I see we've got a question, I'll get to that now. If you're going to start licensing IP for as part of your business model, then it's really important to understand the terms by which you do it for. And as a lawyer, I can tell you, 90% of the time, when someone asks us an IP-related question around a dispute that they're having around their business, 90% of the time, our answer is, it depends on what the license agreement says. So it's really crucial if you're going to be licensing IP for yourself or licensing your IP to others, that you start to understand the terms. That's going to be things like the fees. What fees are you going to charge for, for, for that license? The period. You know, how long is this license going to exist for? Are there any usage restrictions? Can, if I li license you my, um, my design concept or my, let's keep with the, with the, with the creative campaign. If I license you, if I create a, a music festival and I license you the ability to utilize that, that name, how long is that for? You know, and, and are there any restrictions on where you can do it? Are you restricted to which country you can do it in? Are you strict? If I license you my photo, are you restricted to using it just on social media or can you use it on billboards? So it's really important to think of these restrictions. Then there's exclusivity. Am I licensing it to just you or can anyone use it? Right? There'll be resale. Are you able to resell this to other people? So me licensing you my photo, does that allow you to license to someone else? So if you think about the Getty Images example, if I'm a photographer, I load my photo onto Getty Images, I essentially license Getty to be able to resell it onto others. But it's really important if you're starting to think about your IP, are you allowing people resale? Renewal, once the license term is done, what happens after that? And royalties, are you earning, if I license something to you, am I earning any royalties on, the, uh, on that license. That's just another way. So we've got fees that might be a base fee and there might be royalties that you earn. These are just some examples, but essentially the point that I'm trying to make is that if you are in any way getting to licensing intellectual property as part of your business model, it's really important to understand the license terms um, and to understand what you can and what you can't do. Let's see what this question says. Um, Group Reynolds was owned by Dar uh, Darcia, which produces the quid, Sandara, and the duster. Okay, that's from Mark. I'm not sure. I, I think maybe what you're saying is you, you disagree with, uh, with my point. I will look, I could look into the example later. I believe it, I think there's a, a Vietnamese or an Asian company uh, 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 that originally created the car that, that um, licensed it to Renault, as far as I understand about it. But technicalities, we can look into. It'll be an interesting discussion. Alrighty, so obviously while Renault owns the name Dasta and the, 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 what, the, what is being licensed is the, um, the actual car, the, 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 the actual car and the design. And so Renault would just put its name on it. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So the last one here, so we've looked at license terms, okay? And the last one here, which I want to look at in terms of how we utilize IP as acquisition right? IP is an asset and assets can be bought and sold. This is often, um, often when companies are sold, this is part of what forms up the company's value. 
So if we look at a sale of a company, what are you looking at? You're looking at cash and assets on hand, you know, physical assets, uh, physical property, cash. Um, you might be looking at at um, at existing client bases. And a big part of all of that is you're looking at the IP which is being sold. So what value does the brand hold? Your client customer list, to a large extent, is IP, it's intellectual property, it's not physical. So when you are selling a company or when you're selling your company, your intellectual property is part of what makes up your valuation. And in this day and age, that becomes more and more valuable, right? It's more IP is often looked at as more valuable today than it would have been acquisitions that were happening, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And so if we think about some of the bigger companies around today, like Facebook, as an example, they've got by this point, probably or close on three, what, two point something, three billion uh, people on their network. What's the main thing of value there? I suppose it's probably going to be their, their subscriber base. That's an infinitely valuable thing that if Facebook was ever bought or sold, that's one of the things that would make up part of their valuation. So it's not just their code base, but it's their, their, their subscribers. The Coca-Cola branding I mean, it must be one of the most valuable brands on the planet most recognizable brands on the planet. That is, you know, if you Coca-Cola to be sold, they would obviously, you know, look at the factories, production lines, but part of it would be the brand, which would carry a very hefty fee. You know, and then you can look at other sorts of companies, take law firms or service-based businesses. It's often our client lists that are the valuable things. The fact that the phone rings, that people put trust in you, this is something which is intangible, but can be, a value can be assigned to it. So I guess the point that I'm trying to get you is that one of the ways that you can utilize IP in your business, the usage, is that when you sell your business is that the IP can be sold. Let's look at this. We gained this. Uh, Darcy is a Romanian company, previously nationalized company, was founded by the Romanian government. Okay, that's it, great. Um, I'm not sure where that relates. So I think what you're saying is that uh, they uh, Reno owns that company. Um, great. I mean, yeah, we can look, we can chat about that more more later. Um, cool. Right, we've got another question there. Not a question or an argument, just in uh, brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, cool. So the next thing I want to look at here is now we've looked into intellectual property and its uses in business cases. What I want to do is I want to turn my attention towards protecting your IP. And this is kind of the, the last section that I want to look at here. I want to look at like if you, you as a business owner, what can you do in your business to protect your IP? So just before we kind of delve into this, it's always tough with the webinar to know the, the, the depth or the level of, um, of understanding of the people here. I know we've got, you know, we've got close to, to 30 people or so on, on the webinar. So you know, it's always tough to kind of pitch these things correctly. So I think some of these points are quite general, but I think that even though they're general, you can relate them to any kind of point that you are in your business. Um, and if you want to dig deep, deeper into this or further on any specific aspect here, definitely just come chat to us. But uh, these are kind of my general points that I look at to protect your intellectual property. The first thing is that in order to protect IP, you need to identify its value. Right? And I don't just mean quantifying the value and putting a number to it, but I mean identifying where the value in your IP lies. Um, and every company has a different value, right? So if you take WhatsApp, that is the biggest social media platform on the planet. Um, where's WhatsApp's value? I'd say, you know, partly in the code base, but probably not, you know, the, the idea of voice over IP and chat as many other companies do it. Their value is probably their network, you know? Massive, massive network. And that's the thing which needs to be protected. If you take a company like Legalese, where's our value? Well, it's probably in a bit in the brand name. As I said, the phone rings. We've got systems set up. The systems and the procedures are quite valuable. But it's also the employees. You know, we've got good staff and smart lawyers. And that's where our value lies. Nike. Where's Nike's value? I'd say partly in the branding for sure. But also, you know, Nike's but Nike. They, they focus a lot on design of the shoes and making sure that these are elite sportsman shoes are so probably a lot in their design. And so every company has a different level of value or different place of value. And I guess the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that for you as a business owner, you need to understand where your company's value is. And this is often a very common issue that we see with SMEs that um, they might 
not quite understand where the value is in their business. And, and it's very hard to know what to do with your IP if you don't know where that value is. Or if the value is not in the right place in the business, it's very hard to protect it. I'll give you an example. Let's take as an example a, a clothing manufacturer, right? They might say, listen, the, the, the clothing designs are our IP. Now, and that's what we need to protect. So if we looked at cool, how do you protect designs? Well, you're gonna protect them through design registrations. Problem with that is, I just don't think that's where the value really lies, right? Like clothing designs, firstly, are always gonna be copyable. You know, you can have a golf shirt, all you would need to do, and you could protect the design, all you'd need to do is change a little bit of it and suddenly it's a different design. Also designs change year by year, right? Like what's fans fashionable today with clothing is not gonna be fashionable next year. And also, you know, once Louis uh, Versace and, and the, you know, top fashionable brands on the planet create a design, a couple of years la later, you're going to find it in Woolworths and pick and pay store, all on the, the equivalents all around the world. So I would say for a clothing manufacturer, really where their value lies is going to be in their brand. And how, what do you have to do in your, with your IP to take the value away from the clothes and transfer it into the brand so that every, um, so that every, so that so that people when they think of your brand they are relating these ideas uh of their of what we call goodwill they're they're transferring their goodwill from you know your clothes to thinking about your brand so it doesn't matter what clothes you put out they're always going to uh they're going to relate to those ideas that goodwill to your brand whenever they see your brand um another one in, which is quite big in the tech industry would be digital trust you know, why is it that I'm totally happy to, 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 to make payments through SnapScan or, uh, or pay you or kind of the more, more distinguished um, payment platforms where I wouldn't through others? Or why is it that I'd be happy to rent my house on Airbnb, but if I buy something on, on a company like Gumtree, I'm, you know, I assume that I'm, you know, I'm, so that I might be in danger. Like, why is it that, that these things happen? Well, it's because companies put a lot of time and attention into into protecting their uh, communities and building digital trust in their brands. And that's something which is very, very valuable. Something which you should be thinking about when looking to how, you know, under where's the value in your company? How do you create, communicate that trust to your, uh, to your audience? So maybe that's not gonna give all the answers to everyone, but I think it's an interesting thing to be thinking about. The next thing of how do you protect your IP is what I say, you've got to play the man, not the ball. Why do I say this? Well, ideas cannot be owned. Certainly in South Africa, they can't be owned. Um, but what you can do is control the relationship between you and the people that you work with. So you have an idea. If you pitch it to someone and tell it to someone, that idea is out in the open. Anyone can use it. But what you could do is you could get a non-disclosure agreement, a contract in place that doesn't protect the idea, but that governs the relationship between the two people who share the idea, right? So I say, listen, I don't own this idea, but if you sign this non-disclosure, it means you can't steal it. You owe me a, an obligation not to steal that idea. Then throughout your, your business, you're gonna see the same sort of thing, right? If you have developers working on your product, you need to make sure that they are locked into some sort of confidentiality agreement so they can't take your code base or your ideas and use it elsewhere. If you have business partners that you work with, how do you make it clear which IP you own and which you, which you don't? And certainly with your customers, you need val you're gonna need some sort of a license with strict terms so that your customers understand how they're using your IP if you run a, a business that's primarily focused around IP and what they can, what they can't do with it. So for example, you know, we often draft contracts for a living. We wanna make sure that our clients utilize the contracts, but not that they you know, would copy them and, and templatize them and put them on the internet. So, so, so we have to, all businesses need to govern the, the relationships of people that we send our IP to and not the actual ideas themselves. So that's a bit of a, a, a philosophical and a deeper one, but it's really important that we, that we need to protect the relationships, not the ideas themselves. The next one is, is intellectual property policies, right? And it used to be that on every website, there was a small tab on the bottom with a bunch of text. And you said, you know, I accept that no one took it very seriously and it wasn't very serious. <clears throat> then a few years ago, we had the Cambridge Analytica saga, which led to a lot of chaos in the world. And I think this was one of the biggest and most public examples of a real use case of where our online privacy and our online like 
like uh, activities can really, really be a lot more damaging or uh, damaging to us or valuable to other people. What happened next is that you saw every site around the world start updating their IP policies and how they utilize your data, which is a type of IP, right? GDPR, which is uh, General Data Protection Regulations, which is Europe's uh, data policies, um, that those were enacted in South Africa. We've got the Protection of Personal Information Act. Poppy it was enacted this year, been a big thing. And essentially, everyone around the world started to take this thing about online intellectual property and data a lot more seriously. And IP isn't just about making sure people don't copy your idea or steal it. IP management is also around managing your IP and managing the IP that you're creating and that you're working with, right? So you know, what we need to be thinking about is, is, you know, what is your privacy policy for users? How are you going to keep their data and their IP private? You know, how you, uh, where, how are you going to keep that as data? Where are you actually going to store it? What users can and what they can't do on your site? What are the terms on use or using your IP? What disclaimers or warranties do you as a company give around the use of IP on your website, the use of data? I suppose in 2021, this is no longer just a copy and paste exercise, right? If you're running a digital business, then it you need to start to treat your IP and your customer's IP, their data or anything else, you need to start to treat a lot more carefully because clients expect that of us. This is, while it wasn't important a few years ago, I think it's quite important to think about how we manage our IP and our data. And, uh, and I think this is only get, going to get more important as we go. Right? The next thing here is around creative methods for IP protection. Right? So, you know, often companies are looking at to cool, how do you protect IP? Well, we've got our traditional things that we mentioned, copyright, trademark, patents, design registrations. But I think there's some other kind of more creative and often free methods that that uh, that you could look at. Right? Um, for photos, you can copyright images, right? There, you can use the copyright symbol. You know, it's not a foolproof thing, but it's free to put a copyright symbol. People won't steal them, or people might not steal them, but less likely to steal them. You can also watermark your photos, a free way to make sure people don't steal your, your photos. I mean, another one to make, way to make sure people don't steal your photos is not to load uh, IP, which is valuable to you, not to load it online. We often get creatives of different sorts telling us that they, their designs have been stolen where they've loaded after they've loaded to Instagram. And, you know, there, there is an aspect that, the internet is not a safe place. If you, something is, you want people to see it, load it to the internet. If you want people not to steal it, don't. Um, developers with dummy code, that's actually, should have been removed from the slideshow. That's for another point, so ignore that one. Um, then publishers, there, there's a copyright symbol, as we've mentioned. You, you know, you can put that little copyright symbol, there's also that little R symbol for a registered trademark. So we can use these things and they start to communicate to people that see them, that, the, that these, that, um, that, your, your content or your IP has been protected. Then for brand names, you know, registering a trademark is a fantastic way to protect your brand name, but it also can get quite expensive, especially if you are starting to register in different countries. Mm. So one of the things that I certainly recommend is utilize the free tools, right? Register the social media handles of your business. Register the domains out there, right? It's going to cost you, you know, somewhere between 80 to maybe a thousand rand, depending on, on you know, the, the domain that you want to register, but you can start buying up the domain names. And then obviously registering the Facebook uh, name, the Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, et cetera. These are all free tools that you have in order to create some sort of like a digital um, footprint of your brand. So if I'm starting a company, one of the first places I'm going to go is look on social media and see, well, has anyone else used that brand name? So I think like, um, this is something which we need to think about. There's a lot of free tools that are out there which you can use. Another question here. Lloyd, how do you formally copyright, in my case, software IP? Or is it simply okay to use the C? So software is an interesting one. It's kind of dealt with differently in all, all types of, in all countries. And the reality is we don't actually have a very clear answer on this in South Africa. Um, so when you start to, when you think about software, again, you need to start to break that up into the different elements. So software is going to form firstly a name of your software, like that, your brand name. There's going to be the code base and there's going to be the operations, right? Like the, the actual nuts and bolts of it. 
how do you protect the operations you need to put some effort in if you as you know as i certainly know you know developers like you lloyd do you put up into figuring out well how do i physically protect this stuff you know is it where where is it housed is it housed on a place that no one can steal it or is it housed in a place that 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 might be easier for people to access it through um you know if uh, through open source or, or or something like that right? The brand name, you can protect it. And then when it comes to code base, I mean, this is a question of how code base is actually protected and different jurisdictions are dealing with this differently. <clears throat> In South Africa, it could, one option is that it could be protected through copyright because it's code, uh, it's words. Another one is that it could be protected through some sort of a patent uh, protection. But you know, this is something which, which is not settled uh, in South African law yet, but that we're going to see more, uh, you know, progressions on as, 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 IP as the IP law develops. Well, but that's certainly one we can chat. I know we've chatted about that one. We can definitely chat more about Lloyd. Pleasure. Um, all right. The next thing, which the, the kind of next thing here, which I want to look at is progress. And this is progress is one which I think is a really, really good way for us to protect our, our IP as we grow our businesses. Um, what is this quote? It's a quote that I love from the um Aaron Sorkin film, my favorite writer, Aaron Sorkin film, The Social Network, where Zuckerberg says, um, if the defendant had invented Facebook, they would have invented Facebook. We get a lot of people trying to protect ideas. And as we said, ideas are hard to protect. And what we've also said is no one should be able to own ideas to block people from using them. That's just not how the world and, and, our, and our ideas are grown, progress, right? We all stand on the shoulders of the people that, that came before us and all ideas are, 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 are building on the ones that came before them. So what do I mean by this, by progress, is that getting to market first, getting your idea out there, getting the customers on board, getting traction, it's often these things that you know, just being a day before your competitor, a little bit before your competitor, so that you're first out there and the first one, you know, owning and getting to that idea. These are often the things that that really, really help us to to keep a lead. So if you've got an idea, don't sit in it for years. You know, don't sit before you launch it. At some point, someone else is going to launch that uh, that idea. So the ability to actually get at something out there and get traction on it is often the biggest protection. Why do I say third to market? Well, because there's another theory in it as well, in that the most valuable thing is not getting first to market. It might be getting third to market in the sense that, you know, the first ones out there are the ones that test it out, test the water, maybe make the um, see those, make the, the mistakes in the process. And uh, you, as if you get there a little bit later, you're able to, to really capitalize on what's come before you. And the second last thing I want to mention here is that you need to develop an IP strategy. Every company needs an IP strategy and what they plan to do with their IP and how they plan to develop the IP. You know, so according to SARS, uh, IP is an asset, it can be bought, sold, and licensed. It's, uh, like I've said, so there's exchange control restrictions. Each time it changes hands, they'll be taxed, but crosses borders will be taxed. So in general, you need to think a little bit deeper about your IP. So you know, where is it going to be funded? Might be, you know, to, to depend on where you register your IP where your client base is might have a difference in, in how you utilize it, the different regulations and different countries around IP and jurisdictions. These are things that are really going to, to affect our IP strategy. And I think that if your company is primarily an IP-based one, you really need to start thinking about your strategy as a whole, but how you plan to use it, grow it, uh, own it, sell it, et cetera. The last thing I want to say is quite a simple, but, but quite an important one is that you know, we need to build trust-based relationships. This is one of the ways that we protect our IP. This is often really forgotten, you know, and even as a lawyer, you know, I can tell you that the best contracts in the world often don't replace uh, basic trust. And so, you know, and we need to be a bit cautious in working with people. If you've never worked with someone before, maybe don't hand your whole database of information over to them. Right. If someone's got a reputation of uh, of of you know stealing ideas, maybe be cautious around working with them. And so we often hear stories about and, and deal with matters where people have had their IP stolen or misused. And one of the things we look at is that the signs were there early. And you need to so I really think this point of develop actual trust-based relationships is a really, really important thing when looking at how you develop your IP. So that is about it. Um, that's my general thoughts on, 
you know, we've gone through a lot here, but I think my main point on this thing is that um, we all have some aspects of IP in our work and we need to really start to delve with it and understand how, what it is, how we use it and how we protect it um, and develop an IP strategy of your own, which is specific to your company, which has a focus on your actual IP, which you can execute in your business. And that is it for me. If there's any questions, actually took a little bit longer than I thought it would take. I, maybe I was uh, overzealous and thinking I'll get through it in half an hour. Um, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. We've got one that's popping up here. Liesl, appreciate that. Absolute pleasure, Liesl. Um, yeah. Thank you. I suppose if anyone wants to log off, they can as well. But I'm happy to sit here for a few minutes to... Uh, to see if there's any uh, any questions that come up. Thank you, Shivani. I really appreciate that. We've, uh, there's the Q&A function. Sorry, let's go to that one as well. Um, what signs should you look out for then? Hi, what signs should you look out for for then that you can show that you can't trust someone? Oh, okay. So what, what should you be looking out for to know if someone, you can't trust someone? Well, I suppose, I mean, that's a, 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 an interesting one. Um, I mean, look, you know, I think a reputational thing is definitely a question. Like, does someone have a reputation for, for misusing IP? I don't want to use any examples, but I can certainly think of some companies in South Africa that... Um, that you know have a reputation for either stealing designs um, or utilizing without permission and I think like that's something to look out for reputationally um and yeah I mean signs within the business relationship you know if you have signs that things weren't weren't feeling right as as you started the relationship I mean yeah I mean how do we at any point in life how do we decide if we can trust someone it's an interesting question um Mark could you give more insight into criminal penalties infringements under the copyright act um I can't at the moment. I, I'm unsure if they're criminal. Uh, if there are criminal penalties for copyright infringement, I could look into that. Um, they and there would definitely be. Look, you, if you if you infringe someone's copyright, you definitely uh, create damages, right? Which is like a civil wrong that you do to one person. If I take your IP and I use it without your permission, there's damages mm. that would be created. Whether there's criminal um, criminal action that you've done, I'm unsure of, Mark. I don't think so offhand, but I'd need to have a look at the act. Um, why don't you get in touch with me? Uh, let me put our email addresses over here. You can grab, get in touch with us through the website or if you've got my email address, and I'd be happy to look into that. It's an interesting question. I don't offhand think that there's any criminal action there, but I could be wrong. Um, Will the presentation or recording to e be emailed to us, Palissa? Um, yes, unless you will. The, this whole the recording will be emailed to you for sure. Uh, Tasha, thank you for your time. Very informative. We're currently creating educational content for surf therapy related programs. Very new. This info has helped me and will be a bit many more protecting. Thank That's fantastic. Yeah, and I think educational content. Look, the one thing that, that's really come out in the last year or so of the pandemic is creating content for educating online. Like the educational landscape is completely changed, right? Like our online education is huge and will only continue to grow. And so what is it that you're protecting there? Well, it's your content, right? Which you own a copyright over. But the nature of running an online educational platform is that it can be stolen. So that's where I come back to that point about digital trust and brand. You know, if I could download all the coursework for a Harvard course, would is that the same as actually doing a Harvard course and getting that Harvard certificate at the end? At the end? Certainly not, right? Because Harvard communicates a lot of goodwill in that certificate and we all understand something about if someone's got that certificate whether they've got the education from it or not and i think that's a really interesting thing to be thinking about with with education how do we transfer the value of our ip away from just the content into people wanting to work with our institution and you know obviously get smarter that uh, they've done that incredibly and they've managed to open up these institutions to the rest of the world uh, through that method so i think like like education is a fantastic uh, use case for this um Thanks so much. So great to get honest information for free on a subject. It's quite intimidating. Uh, is there any way we can sign up for notifications for future talks? There is actually. Um, if you 
respond just email info at legalese we'll get you signed up to our newsletter which we which uh, we send all these things to or well, i think by nature of you coming to this talk we probably we can sign you up from there uh, pleasure megan sharon expect a long email from us thanks so much only a pleasure sharon i hope it's a nice email um uh, but yeah that sounds great mm. let's see if there's anyone over here if there's aren't any can um if ip if i create ip in terms of a contract of service does the person who contract me own the ip or do i so i mean that that's a very interesting uh question so if if you create say copyright right if by, by the nature of creating copyright you own it but if you create copyright for someone else then that if you commissioned it through through employment then the person who employed you or commissioned you will own it. So it is important if you if that's not going to be the case for you to differ that by contract. So you know if you are creating IP for someone else that you want to own, you need to make sure that that is covered in the contract. Very good question. Thanks, Carl. Um, I'm working on a children's character. It has a name. There is a sketch. It needs to be completed by a 3D artist and a unique print pattern created that will be applied to the character. What should I protect similar to how the likes of disney do it also how do i ensure i can license for merchandise one day okay so that's a great question right so if you think about disney um your disney characters mickey mouse donald duck these are definitely owned you know owned characters all the names and the and the the, the images of them are going to be owned by disney and there are cases of disney you know disney has an ip strategy related to how they protect their designs right um and I actually do know, because I've dealt with my matter related to Disney a while ago, is that Disney are actually quite permissive in certain instances of people using, say, the Mickey Mouse ears, <clears throat> because it has formed part of pop culture. So Disney's, their strategy is they're unlikely to sue a pop culture artist for using the, the ears, but they might sue you if you utilize the designs to, you know, in your cartoon or something. So uh, Disney have a um, method or a strategy on how they protect the IP. So what would you do with this? Well, the nature of designing the character, right? Drawing the picture, you're going to own the copyright of that character, okay? So you're going to own the picture of that, that character through a copyright. If you are working with a 3D artist to create it, well, then it's crucial that you make sure that that 3D artist understands that any 3D rendering that they do of, you, of the character is assigned to you. Now, by nature of the Copyright Act, you could say, well, listen, you automatically own it. But my view is like, don't, un don't assume anything, especially if this is going to be core to your business. So if you are getting someone to design the 3D render of your, of your character, I'd say it's important to get an assignment in place. It can be a one pager that they say, you know, I'm doing this on your behalf and you own the character. And that would be the same for the voice or any other, um, you know, the print and the pattern or anything else that you're doing with it. Um, and through doing that, you know, like then you can start to like figure out in more detail, like, cool, are you going to name the character something? Maybe you want to register that name as a trademark. Um, if you're going to build that character up in the public, sure, the social media domains, et cetera. And it's, you start to like put your, 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 your digital footprint and your IP footprint down and protecting the different elements of that character. And then over time, as the character develops, one day it gets to the point of Mickey Mouse or, or, or Homer Simpson but, you know, Homer Simpson's protected after what, 23 or 30 seasons of, of Simpsons um, and through exerting the, the, the rights to it. And that's another actually very interesting point. Like, you know, the, the more you exert your rights over IP, the more protected it is. So if you allow anyone to use it and don't actually technically or physically protect it. So if in someone <clears throat> utilizes your design, your character without your permission, if you just let it go and let it go and let it go, over time, you're going to lose the rights in it. And there's some really interesting examples of that happening. Um, one would be the, the, the source, Sriracha. The Sriracha source used to be a, a name of an actual company that created it. And today, it's just the generic name for the source because uh, it wasn't actually protected. So that's something which you need to do. You need to be uh, clamping down when you see infringements. But again, that falls as part of your IP strategy and how deeply you want to protect that IP. What agreements do you put in place with designers who create the characters? Okay, as I said, that would be some sort of a, an assignment, copyright assignment. It doesn't need to be, can be a very in-depth agreement. We could definitely draft one for you, but you know, if you're just starting off your business, it can be, definitely be something which you 
you know, you put onto a, a one page and to say like, you as a designer understand that you're designing this for me. I own all the copyrights in it. You assign any copyright or intellectual property rights over to me. But let's say yes, the presentation and the recording will be emailed over to you. Okay, I think that is it. I'm gonna put my email address here if there's anyone that wants to uh, ask me questions personally. And there's also the info at legalese. That's the address. Okay, that takes us to 102. Last question here. Let's see this. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. I uh, hope everyone has a brilliant weekend and a strong end to the year. And yeah, all the best. Thanks for joining Legalese for this uh, webinar. Cheers.